And so this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about those last stan that last stanza, the hymn begun on belief, which says, Since all that I meet shall work for my good, the bitter is sweet, the medicine food. Though painful at present, it will cease before long, and then, oh how pleasant, the conqueror's song. One man certainly is an embodiment of this stanza. Beige, rise for your captain and celebrate the CEO and MD of the Beige Bank, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Nyeneku. Thank you. Thank you very much. Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison. Vice Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Maxwell Opoku Afari. Nime, former governors of the Central Bank, directors of BEIGE, captains of industry, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my childhood friends at the back, Mamiya Joa, my daughter, Irabna, my daughter, good afternoon. And Team Beige, what we've been waiting for is here. Finally, it's about to go down. I thank you all sincerely for marking today with us. It's a momentous occasion for us at Beige, a day my dear mom would never forget, and a humbling afternoon for me as the leader of Team Beige. It's my mom's birthday today. And dear governor, she put a request before me when she heard you would be in attendance. My mom says that in all her life, as a former banker with the Bank for Housing and Construction, this afternoon is the closest she's ever come to a governor and the greatest birthday present I can offer her is a photo with the governor. So, sir, before you leave, please sort me out on this one. This afternoon, I hope to share three things with you. The story of Beige, my take on recent events happening in the industry, finally, my thoughts about the future. The story of Beige began in 2008. We commenced operations with a stated capital of 1 million Ghana cities. And our hopes at the time were that we would be considered for a savings and loans license, as then most of the SNLs at the time had the same level of capital. Our application was turned down by the BOG on the grounds that unlike existing players who had been given time to build up their capital, we, as new entrants, had to cough up the entire 7 million required at once. So we had to first operate as an MFI, as a microfinance institution, until 2012, when we successfully upgraded as a savings and loans company. My memories of our first two years as a savings and loans company sometimes make me emotional. I recall that for a period of about two years, I withheld salary increments just to ensure that our expenditure was under control. During that period particularly, I faced the stiffest of rejection from my team and staff turnover was at its peak. I recall that on some occasions, I had to visit selected key staff at odd hours to appeal to them to believe with me. And for this, I proudly would want to mention Dauda Hafiz Dean, Louisa Lai, Jonathan Sam, David Sobojo, Alex Opoku, Peter Jumo, Jean Esuman, Nanefia, and our first board members, Dr. Theophilos Adomako and Aaron Opoku Wahene. <laughs> for the sacrifices that you guys made for me and Beige, I invoke the favor of heaven upon you and your families. Yes. God bless you. I'd like to extend our most profound appreciation to the Central Bank, particularly 
the team at the Banking Supervision Department who have handheld us up to this point. God bless you too. And to our diehard customers, words won't be enough to show how much we appreciate you. God bless you too. And to all of you who have in diverse ways supported us materially, physically, emotionally, and all, God bless you too. Ladies and gentlemen, when we started Beige, our strategic intents were that within 10 years, we would have laid a foundation for what would become not just a bank, but a universal financial services provider. And in 15 years, that financial services provider should have a world-class appeal. Today, we're lucky to have a bank. Already, we have an assets manager, a life insurance company, a health insurance company, and a pension funds manager. All our subsidiaries combined together with our investee affiliates provide direct employment to 5,000 individuals. So as you can tell, that foundation we've been working at is gradually taking shape. And we're convinced that next year by now when we will be marking our 10th, if God wills, that foundation will be complete. Thanks to all of you. Amen. We still have loads of issues, so we can't claim to be perfect at all. However, we are bold to say we are a very willing to learn group that hopes to get better with age. Dear Governor, a lot has happened since September 8, when the new minimum capital was announced. The timing of that announcement, coupled with the events three weeks prior to that, have significantly impacted on confidence in our local institutions. What's most disturbing about this is the seemingly uninformed speculation about what could befall institutions that are unable to meet this requirement. This has resulted in a drastic flight of deposits from local to other institutions, a situation which is gradually raising the cost of deposit acquisition despite the gradual reduction of the prime rate. If this trend continues, financial performance and ultimately shareholder reserve positions would be negatively affected and in the end, shareholder positions would also decline. I pray that this forecast would not materialize because it would further weaken the bargaining capacity of local banks as we go to the market in search for capital. My take is a bit more clarity from the central bank on the future of local institutions would do a lot to inform the public. My life has become a bouquet of experiences and favor. In this small crowd are people whom I owe debts of gratitude for a variety of reasons. Some for my investee entrance fees, my first job, my first deposit client, and even the lady that handed me my first broken hat. People are looking around. I know, I won't tell. But beyond the people gathered here are some three persons who have impacted my life tremendously. Without they themselves knowing, they are Mr. Okine, Ken Ophoriata, and Edward Effa. I was a nine-year-old class five pupil when I met Mr. Okine. He worked at the Tudu branch of the defunct Bank for Housing and Construction. Together with my mom, his office was on the first floor. A fine looking man he was, highly respected at the office. And on his table was this green nameplate which had the inscription accountant on it. I didn't know what accountant meant at the time. And what freaked me most about him was he wore his watch on the right. Anytime I closed from school and went to wait for my mom at her office, I made sure I find my way to see my idol. So mama, it should no longer be a mystery to you why I've always wanted to be an accountant and why I wear my watch where I do. My mom is seated by two women that I'd like to acknowledge today. The three mamas in my life.
The mama that gave birth to me, the mama that gave me the opportunity to further my tertiary education, Mrs. Gifty Afinidazi. And then the mama that taught me how to be a man in my last year in school, who handheld me to get my first job at Deloitte and Tush, Mrs. Teresa Adamvo. Hey, Mr. Okine, so rest in peace for now. If you're my age or thereabout, then it's impossible to miss Kenufreata, because we idolize and still do idolize Data Bank. But Edward Ifa I met because I worked with Deloitte and Touche, and on a few occasions was assigned to audit Fidelity Discount House. He was in a white shirt, and his office was positioned such that at the swing overhead, you could see everything happening on the shop floor. And gosh, I so admired him and how his office was conducted. So when I set up my first office, that's the beige office at Adenta, I positioned my office such that I could see everyone on the shop floor. Anytime I get opportunity, I like to honor these seniors for a reason. By remaining resolute in their endeavors, they have fueled the aspirations of many others. My generation has started doing things, not because we are smarter, but because these seniors dared first and they flattened the barriers. I recount these stories just to emphasize the impact of role modeling in our society. Over the last decade, a lot has happened in entrepreneurship and financial services in Ghana. Banks have emerged out of the blue, obviously inspired by the extent to which the Nigerian invasion coupled with the Togolese aggression disrupted our markets. It is true that not all the banks that emerged during this period have made it, but it is also true that others have outdone the milestones set by their predecessors. When we founded Beige, we were inspired by the exploits of the then CEO of Data Bank and Fidelity. Thus, we caused a disruption in the microfinance market by following their footsteps. Today, nine years later, several other institutions have also traced the path of Beige and are creating their own territories. These include direct savings and loans, which, sir, you gracefully launched at Maven Peak a few months ago. I believe that 10 years from today, if nation building is to be sustained, those ahead of Beige should move into international boundaries. Beige should cover the nation. Direct savings and their colleagues should be market leaders so that another opportunity will be created for a new entrant. <laughs> Yours truly, school that presec. I know there are some corporate voice here, some are on my right. The only school in Ghana is Presec because I have the microphone. <laughs> Some of our board members will strangle me after this. I see the Accra Academy people. <laughs> anyway, one of my fondest memories in our time at Presec was how we chanted in support of our 100 by 4 relay team anytime we participated in the inter schools athletics competition famously called Intaco. I'm sure you're all familiar with the 100 by 4 relay race. My friends at the back will debate this, but because I have the microphone, I'm kin. Relay teams normally would comprise top sprinters. And for a particular season, our relay team was arranged in an awkward order. The second best would start the race, passes on the baton to the fourth best, who passes on the baton to the best of them all, who finally hands it over to the third best. It was a strange order because one would have thought that they should be arranged in order of the least to the best. So out of curiosity, I asked Mr. Boy Badu, our PE instructor at the time, when I met him just recently, why he arranged the team like that. And here's what he said. I needed to put the last man in a position of advantage. So I tactically, so tactically I start with the second best, who's subjective in the race is to try to give us a lead or at least hold our place. When he passes it on to the second person, who in this case is the fourth best, that person's objective is to at least do his best to watch over what has been handed over to him. 
When the baton gets to the third runner, who is our best, his objective is to recover from all our losses, establish a lead for us, and then achieve a third objective, which is a secret. It's a do or die lap, he said, and a performance of that person in the third lap would normally determine the outcome of the race. And I remember that guy so well. He was the bow-legged brother called Tom Pugsy. You should watch the whole team of blue-shirted preset boys rise up chanting in the stands as we watch Tom Pugsy skillfully navigate that curve. And here comes the part that even struck me most. I noticed that our last guy doesn't wait for Tom Pugsy to get to him, but rather starts running even before Pugsy gets there. That's really, Pugsy would have done more than 100 meters of sprinting. So by the time our last guy receives the baton, he can only fly to the finish line. So I further asked Mr. Boybadu, why did Pugsy have to do more than 100 meters in that lap? And he said, that was my secret. Besides establishing the lead for Presec, Paxi's third mandate was to put his successor in a position of advantage. That's when Paxi feels we know the race is lost. The moral of the relay race brings into sharp focus the essence of generational planning or succession planning in nation building. I believe that in this art of nation building, not only do the economic growth indicators matter, but also the psychological motivation of the people must be looked at. Interestingly, sir, Honorable Kenoforiata, past governors, including all my seniors gathered here, and your contemporaries are the Tompaxis for me and my generation. It is for this reason that I'd like to draw your attention to the potential challenges that could face banks of Ghanaian ownership if the modalities of the recent capital increase are not re-looked at. We stand the risk of literally gifting the absolute control of our financial services sector, the gateway to every economy, to foreigners in the interest of economic development. And for the life of me, I can bet that the original intent of this government would not be to marginalize local participation in the financial services space the gateway to every economy. Plus, I'm sure that we will be depending on Ghanaian banks to provide services in particularly the non-urban districts where the One District, One Factory initiative would be implemented. It's also dangerous to sort of create a mindset amongst Ghanaians that as for us, we can't do this. And that financial services are a thingy for some people Psychologically, we will be putting a cap on the mindset of our children and limiting their capabilities. Trust me, today the average Nigerian believes they can conquer the world just because of the exploits of some of their multinational entrepreneurs. Another leader led his people to believe, yes, we can. And the entire world watched in awe as Americans voted into history the first black president. Just recently, another one wrote on the wings of, let's make America great again. And lo and behold, another shocking electoral victory occurred. So the psyche of the people is powerful, and we must not underestimate the impact of what we make them believe in. This idea of a Ghana beyond A that our president, Nana Ekufuado, has been promoting is working. My friends and I have fully bought into it. Yet the truth is, we do know, we do not know, we don't have the financial muscle nor the size of balance sheets that would impress you today. But does that mean we should be excluded when our handicap was not caused by us? So I ask again, what type of Ghana will it be? Will it be a Ghana that is owned by foreigners, but with locals playing an insignificant minority role? Or a Ghana that has its citizenry also sitting at table with fairly equal rights. We need to know, because we also will be some paxis for another group that are coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you on authority that although this generation may not have any financial credentials to show for now, 
we have a will which when allowed to prevail could blow your mind. So please do not shut the door of opportunities on us because we too believe in this Ghana beyond aid. And when we get there, we do not want to be spectators scrambling for leftovers. Thus, in the exercise of this privilege to govern our people, we must be careful not to amputate them because their children and your great-grandchildren would inherit the consequences of the decisions we make today. The good book in Proverbs 13, 22 says it all. Does anyone here know that some foreign banks have been in Ghana since 1896? Yes. For 121 years, some of the banks have banked my great-great-grandfather, my great-grandfather, my, my grandfather, my father, myself, and now possibly my children. And each of these banks started with one branch only. I believe that these businesses have transcended the years, not because their founders were too smart or never made mistakes. No, they were fallible. They have lived because the system was not going to allow them to die. Barely three weeks ago, most of us viewed keenly the interview granted by our president to Al Jazeera. And in a response to a question related to Trump's pro-America policies, he intimated that it makes sense for Trump to seek the interests of his people first before that of others. He reiterated similar comments just two weeks ago when French President Macron passed through. The president's remarks ignite a sense of confidence in our leadership in me and makes me proud to be Ghanaian. Yet I am afraid that words alone won't get us there if they are not translated into deliberate local content policies. Before I bow, I'd like to admit that we could not have been here without ruffling a few feathers. Therefore, on this day, I'd like to offer a personal apology on behalf of all of us at Beige to any one of our stakeholders whom we may have offended on our way to this destination. Please pardon us and give us another chance. We're still learning. So my seniors, there's a wind blowing. It's a wind of change. It's a very contagious and stimulating wind. This wind is carrying with it a feeling of hope self-belief, and somehow an aura of patriotism. Suddenly, people of Ghanaian descent are thinking big and global, in spite of the obvious lack of resources. So let's take advantage of this wind and galvanize Ghanaians into action and endeavor, keeping in mind, however, that many of these entrepreneurial adventures may fail, but I believe that if one out of every 10 succeeds, the wheels of prosperity would gradually be turning in our favor one business at a time. Of what use would our lives on this earth be if we would only spend it witnessing and reading about the successes of others? I have no doubt in my mind that no matter the circumstances, at the pa of I thank you once again, and you're welcome to the page bar. And one more time, ladies and gentlemen, let's celebrate this fine, illustrious son of the motherland, a true leader, a worthy statesman, a thought leader. And we salute you, our brother and friend, Mr. Mike Nineku. Ladies and gentlemen, he certainly makes true that ancient wisdom of our fathers that in youth we learn and in age we understand. A man of understanding, Mr. Michael Nyeneku. One more time, let's celebrate our leader. We thank you, sir, for those very thought-provoking words. And the last bit, your call to us to support men and women who start ventures, no matter how small. Because you, my friend, are a shining example of the fact that a man's elevation is a source of a people's preservation. Who would have thought that by this little idea you nurtured in your heart and started, 
our lives could be transformed in such a great way. Ladies and gentlemen, let's celebrate God once more for this great gift, Mr. Michael Nyenekou.